as we are standing, turn to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, from verse 1 to verse 7. And if we can read together, 2 Timothy chapter 2, from verse 1 to 7. The Bible says this, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. And your hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please his commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all these. And that's the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, I thank you and bless you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for each and every one of us gathered in this place. We submit ourselves to you, to the leading of your spirit, to the instruction of your spirit, and Lord, that as you say in your word, the entrance of your word brings light. It brings understanding to the simple. May your word bring understanding to each and every one of us in our varied circumstances. Would you speak to us? Lord, we give you glory for who you are and for your faithfulness to us. May you be exalted in this place. May you use me as your vessel this morning. And Lord, may you open our hearts to receive not from man, but from you. For this we pray, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may have your seats. Buana Sifiwe Tena. Greetings from my wife uh, and my children. Uh, they will be here in the second service. Um, and uh, I just want to thank God for the opportunity to be able to come and share with us from the Word of God. And I'll be sharing on the subject, and trust. If you read that particular portion of scripture that we have just read, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, it says, And whatever you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, then this word comes in, and trust to reliable men who will also pass it on to others. What does it mean to entrust? It means to commit to, but not just handing over something, but looking out for somebody who has qualities that satisfy, that, that meet the requirements, that they are trustworthy with the message or with the particular information or with the particular item that you are giving to them. That is why every time you want to take something across the, the city or across the continent or across the world, you look for a trustworthy courier, somebody who will deliver it where it's supposed to be. Because if it doesn't get there, then it is lost along the way. And so Paul writes to Timothy, says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Let's look a bit at the background of this particular book. Of course, we know that there's a preceding book, First Timothy. And then we have... 2 Timothy. And the author is very clearly depicted in verse 1 and verse 2 of 2 Timothy where it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Every time Paul writes, he would introduce himself. Sometimes as a servant, as a born servant, not to boast, but because of the grace that God had put in his heart to serve as an apostle. And then who was the recipient? Again, in verse 1, it, verse 2, it captures there. To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul writes 2 Timothy, not from a very comfortable place. You know, sometimes we, we, we believe we need to have a nice place to sit down and write. But Paul is writing this letter Towards the end, actually it's said to be the, one of the last letters, if not the last letter that he wrote before he was beheaded. He was in prison. This was his second imprisonment in Rome. And the interesting context at this time, there was an emperor called Nero. 
and Nero uh, had ruled for about 10 years, and then the city of Rome caught fire. Real fire, not spiritual fire. <laughs> it caught fire. And because of how the city had been built, it was very difficult to contain the fire, and so literally almost three quarters of Rome got burnt down. And being the emperor, he was very upset. Now, another thing that was happening is that he was going crazy slowly by slowly. <laughs> and so, in fact, the, the name they used to have is um, the, the great God. They used to call him Ep Epiphanes. He used to call himself Epiphanes, which means the great God. But they changed it to another word, Epimens, which means the madman. So they used to call him the madman, but he believed he was the great God, the ruler of Rome. Now, if you know anything about, how many of us remember uh, the compact disc? CD. You know, there are people who didn't find them. Eh? There are things that are called tapes, and then the child is called a CD, and then the grandchild is called a flash disc. <laughs> All right? And now you don't even need it. You just, you know, of course we have the hard disk and you can download stuff. But now there's a time that they had what is called the CD, the compact disc. And the CD was put in a place called a room. All right? And if you could burn music or data into a CD. The history of where they, these engineers got the name burning a CD was from Rome. The city of Rome that was burnt down. So that is how it's called a CD, Rome. So when you're recording stuff on the CD, they say you're burning Rome. A lot of things that we think are just ordinary stuff actually have a great history. Okay? And so in the madness of, of Emperor Nero, he decides because of what is going on in the country or in the empire, let me take out my anger on the Christians. And so persecution goes a notch higher. And it's in this season that Paul is arrested and thrown in prison. And he's writing to his son Timothy, knowing that this might be the last time he speaks to them and to him and to the church. So what's the mood like? There is persecution going on. In fact, the, using the words that were used by the U.S. during the during the Cold War between the U.S., Eastern, Western Bloc, and Russia on the Eastern Bloc, and China, and all these guys. They had this, coined this term, VUCA, which means things were volatile. You never knew what was going to happen next. You could be praising God this morning, and in the afternoon, all of you are in prison. So things were volatile. Property was being confiscated. People were being killed because of what they believed. Uncertainty. Nobody knew what tomorrow would hold. When the emperor is mad, you never know what he will decide tomorrow. Complexity. It was no longer about faith. It was about politics. It was about who has more authority. And that is why the Christians are being persecuted, because they were felt not to be very compliant citizens. Because they believed in a God, and they chose to serve God more than serve the emperor. And ambiguity. Nothing made sense. And so there are things that are happening in the country, in the nation, and everyone is scared. <laughs> and Paul is sitting in prison, looking out, probably once in a day allowed to walk into the sun, and he comes back to this prison, and he realizes, I will never go back to the congregations that I have encouraged to serve God. I will never go back to interact with my people. I'll never go back to see this son of mine, Timothy, but let me put down a letter and send it out. He sees his imminent death, and so he sits down to write his final words. Now, all of us know how important the last words are, all right? In law, it's called the will and testament. So if I get to a place in my life where I know my life is about to end, I sit down and I write down my will. And sometimes the lawyers tell you, write it early. All right? And I know there are some congregations where the pastor has, written, has told them and called a lawyer and told people to write their wills because it explains what happens to your estate. All right? However much, however little. All right? 
Alright? Hizo vya hatu maze, hizo matik, patia kuzo. Hizo, alright? Kama we ni dada, hizo wig, patia anti. Alright? You organize so that what was ikwasanie vitundogo ndogo. Alright? That is the entire purpose of the will. And so Paul is writing this and saying, these are my parting shots. This is what I want to hand over to you, Timothy. I know that you are timid. I know that you are afraid. I know right now persecution is going on. But in the midst of this, God is still at work. And in chapter 4, verse 6 to 9, he writes these words. I'm already being poured out like a drink offering. Now, many times when we hear this statement, it sounds like Paul is just ex- expending his energy in ministry. No, he's actually seeing his end. And he's saying, you know what? This is my final bow. And the time has come for my departure. Now, a lot of people who have walked with God kind of are able to discern when the moment is about to come. And even, even, even God allows in general revelation, even for those of us who are not in the faith, to kind of discern when the moment is coming. And for some of us, we've been called home. Your grandfather has said, I want to see all my children and all my grandchildren. And your parents carry you, take you to the village. And this old man sits there and talks to you and speaks to every one of you and then comes back and calls all the family together and says, listen, this is how I want you to live from here on. Those words are so important that if he had said other things before, they get nullified by the final words. If he says now, so and so will lead this family from here on, it doesn't matter whether he's the firstborn or the lastborn. Because those final words you cling on to. And so I want you to kind of pick the mood of where Paul is at when he's writing this. Pick the mood of where Timothy is at, sitting somewhere and receiving this letter. Because these letters would be sneaked out of prison. It was not allowed for you to communicate. And so Paul probably had one court official or one soldier or one judge who would always come and visit him and say, If you have anything that you want me to send because of what I have seen in you, give me the document. I will pass it on. If you've ever been in prison, I see, see oh, don't, don't feel guilty. Because it is a quite a traffic offense. You know, you are, <laughs> or you are driving, talking on the phone. I've been there. And let me tell you, the experience of being in prison is so interesting. Because until, until actually until when we, we could pay by M-Pesa, somebody had to come and pay. Even when you've been told your fine is 500 shillings. Somebody had to come. Who is free to bring 500 shillings to pay for you? You could not pay for yourself. And so, the dynamics in prison were such that there was no access. So Paul sends this letter. Can you imagine Timothy sitting down somewhere? He already knows this persecution. He already knows many have been arrested. He already knows people like Alexander the coppersmith have, are doing great harm to the believers. That's one of the guys who has been mentioned in the Bible. We are Nisumbua. Paul writes about him. Can you imagine? Everywhere in the world, there's an ancestor of someone who is being mentioned as Sumbua. <laughs> Alexander the coppersmith. And so, Timothy is receiving this letter and sitting there and hearing, hearing these words being the final words of the man he has looked up to as his, as his mentor, as his father, literally. Somebody who has watched him from his lineage, his grandmother, his mother, and now has walked with him up to this point. And he's saying, these are the instructions I want to give you. And I want you to put on Timothy's shoes for a bit and figure out how would you respond when a letter like this is put in your hands. And you know you will never see this person again. You know you will never have the interactions you had again. This is it. And Paul goes on and says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now many times when we read these words, we want to say this when we are standing in front of a 10,000 congregation and everyone is cheering. But Paul is writing this alone in prison. 
He's not counting his present circumstances as the end result of his life. He's looking at what he has done with his entire life, how many he has reached with the gospel, and he's saying, I have done what I needed to do. I don't have anything to show. I may not have any assets to say, now, Timothy, you take this. You handle this. Take care of this congregation. He's just telling him, this is it. I'm being poured out, but I've fought the fight. I've finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his appearing. And Paul shifts from the earthly things and begins to look at what is eternal. Because the earthly things are passing. However beautiful, however great. Unfortunately, today as the church, we've forgotten a lot about the heavenly things. We are here in Occupy till I come. <laughs> but in a moment like this, when all you have is a pen and a parchment... And there is no sight of life after this. And all you know is what you have believed and how you have lived under what you have believed. And the reality that from here is to go beyond this world to receive a crown that no man can give to you. Then perspective shifts drastically. And Paul realizes the greatest thing he can do to his son is to be able to tell him, there are things you have seen in me. There are things you've heard in me. There are ways I have lived. There is a gospel I've shared. There are truths I've de deposited in you and other faithful people. Would you take the charge now to go and entrust it to other people? Now, was Timothy prepared? Was he ready for this? This is the truth. No one is ever ready. No one is ever ready. And somebody said, do it. Do it afraid, but do it anyway. Do it uncertain, but do it anyway. Do it fearful, do it trembling, but do it anyway. And that's why Paul writes to Timothy this, and he's encouraging him, and he's telling him, God did not give us a spirit of timidity or of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. He understood Timothy because Paul was a radical, and there are different temperaments. And sometimes you pick your opposite to work with you. Paul was a super choleric. He was a fighter. He was a go-getter. When he had the... The Christians were increasing in numbers. He asked for letters and went on his way on the road to Damascus to go and persecute the Christians. Because easy conversion would not work. You know those people who have to experience a life-changing encounter for you to get saved. Because this ordinary thing of, oh, is there anybody? That does not work with you. And I know some of you are here. There's a musician, I don't know if you know this musician, called Papa San. Papa San was a gospel artist. He was a secular artist, became gospel artist. Jama wa maraga. Na inaona pa ni wa maraga muko wengi. Watu wa Hillsong do meja. And Papa San was, he grew up in Jamaica. He was, his big brother was a gangster. And his, because his big brother was a gangster, he joined, you know, innocently, the troops. And one day, because of how gangs operate, one day he and his brother were walking unaware that they were in enemy territory and they were cornered by this gang. And the gangsters removed a gun and shot his brother in the head. Pow! And came to shoot Papa San. Papa San by that time was praying. and just saying, God, God, if you are there, please save me. Jesus, if you are there, whoever you are, whoever is up there. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> you know, there are those moments where you, you forget atheism, you forget... You know, it doesn't matter whether it's Christian, whatever, Muhammad, Allah, who, just whoever is up there. Saidi Asahi. And so Papa San says, Jesus, if you are there, save me and I will serve you. And the gangster came and put the same gun that had shot his brother here and clicked and nothing happened. Reloaded, clicked again, nothing happened. Shot on the side, bah! it came out. Came back, nothing. 
the thugs looked at this guy and they were like, this, this is not normal. So they ran. And Papa San stood from there. And he started singing, Jesus, you put my life back together when my heart was broken into the no one, no one, no one like you, Jehovah. He says that is how he got saved. Mamba, akuna injili. Where na chuma. Some of you need that kind of salvation. Labda mekuja hapo na sema hii. Kanisa ya nini? Utakutana. We na Paul mkosa kol moja. God literally shone a light in front of Paul. He went blind. That's when he asked, who are you, Lord? Because he knew anybody who can light a light brighter than the sun in the middle of the day is not an ordinary man. And Paul was not for going for ordinary things. And his conversion was just as radical. Timothy was a cast of tea. Grandmother mekupeleka kanisani. Mama mekupeleka kanisani. Well, ata kablo wokoke uliko naimba worship. <laughs> you know those guys who, they are not saved, they are just in the worship team because ma, shoshua alianza kunileta kanisani na nikona napenda muziki. And you get saved five years later. Then like, why are you getting saved? I mean, me, I was never saved. Grandmother niambetu niyanze kuimba. Timothy was that kind of a guy. And so for him to be told step up, he was a timid person. He was afraid. And Paul knew if he doesn't encourage him, Timothy will probably step back. You see, why Paul tells Timothy, whatever you have learned from me and trust to others is because he who teaches learns twice. You see, when you tell me something and I hear you tell me and then I go and explain to somebody else, I understand it better. It, make, it makes me process it and then come and explain it in my own words. That is the process of learning. All right? When I'm able to take what you have told me and put it in my own words and explain it to somebody else. Okay? He who gives earns twice. Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Because what happens is when you give, you give opportunity for God to replenish you. It's like a river. A river is always fresh because every time water is passing, a river never holds water. The Dead Sea holds water. It has an inlet, but it has no outlet. Anytime water is stagnant, what happens? Algae, rot, it starts stinking. Fresh, clean water left on its own without an outlet after a while becomes dangerous, becomes toxic. And so all of us need to be able to have an outlet. It's not about when you are ready. Sing that song even if you don't know the whole of it. Share that testimony even if you don't remember where it is written. You know, there are times you are told to share your testimony and you are like, yes, my name is so and so and, uh, and I just want to thank God because it is written in the Bible and then you realize you don't know where it is written, <laughs> what is written, how it is written. Okay? The truth is, all of us started somewhere. All of us started somewhere. But begin. Because when you put it into practice, you are able to work it and become better. He who serves, loves twice. For God so loved the world that he gave. The son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. The true test of love is not in being, in, in just giving what I have. It's in serving the person I love. And Christ comes and exemplifies that for us. Discipleship is not just what you hear. It's more importantly what you do. Many of us wait for the big stage. Nangoja sikuine bishop patanipatia madhabahu. Ndiyo mutajua ile mafuta ni mebeba. Just share your testimony with your neighbor. Begin there. Share your testimony with your classmates. Share the gospel with that conductor as you go to town. Because practice makes perfect. And as you practice, you become sharper. You're able to design more how to be able to handle the big stage. Before David stood before Goliath, 
he had fought with lion and bear, and he did probably start with lion and bear. Those were the big ones that he shared. But he probably started by fighting some little foxes, hunting. And then he realized, oh, I have skill. I can take on a bigger enemy. I can take on a stronger enemy. I have tacked on how to overcome even an enemy that is way bigger than me. But if you're just waiting for the day, <laughs> see, they say you don't eat, grow fat, and then exercise to get your perfect body. It won't work. You will die. Six pack it okay. It doesn't work like that. Any, any athlete in this world will tell you you balance your diet with your exercise. Ferdinand Manyala didn't tell himself in his head, Mimi, Ndafunguka. Hundred meters. Mtakiona. Wacha tu nisoshi. <laughs> Yikimbieni, yikimbieni. Mina wangoja. Na wacheki tu. No, no, no. He was constantly practicing, sharpening. When he was running 15 seconds, 100 meters, who knew him? Nobody. When he lowered it to 14, nobody knew him. We started noticing when he started winning the hits. But how many years had he spent on that? They say Usain Bolt spent, I think, five to seven years before he got to the fitness level where he started breaking records. Practice. 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 If you did what you're passionate about for 15 hours a day, I kid you not, you'll be seen from the satellite. Pick whatever you love. Pick the skill that, pick the gift that you love. If you are a footballer, pick it. If you are a musician, pick it. And just say, I will practice this keyboard for 15 hours a day for the next one year. Hello? The next time there's an event and a big artist is coming in or they need somebody to play to appease the president because he's stressed. That's what happened to David. I said, Maka Jamaka nasumbili wana vitu halali. Kuna mavitu zina mutembelea. I said, can we send, can we look for a ministry who can be able to play so that these demons can come down? They were not just looking for somebody anointed. They were looking for somebody skilled. Unajua wengine tu natembe tu nopako, oh shit, it is. Shadadada. Wakilu kiambiwa, haya. Do. Hey. Shit, it is. You need to balance the anointing with the gift. That's why Paul tells Timothy, star up the gift that is in you. Not just star up. Wacha kujipepeta na kuna kitu hiko ndani. Unawasha nini? Hello? <laughs> what are you put, what are you starting? Because God has deposited a gift that needs to be worked so that it can work alongside with your anointing. And that's why they say David was not just a good musician, but the Lord was with him. But when he played, have you ever listened to a song? You know it is secular. But it has changed. Have you ever felt like that? You know, one of my young people introduced me to a mapiano. Unajua <laughs> mapiano. Chani kujifanya hapa mnalenga kusabu mama bisha kwa hapa hivi. Guys, I've not even started singing. The song has not begun. Unasikia tu muhili inaza kufanya. Hey. <laughs> And it just tells you somebody has worked his gift. And the world has noticed. We all dance Jerusalem from here to Kathmandu. Unakutana naka monka kakutu. Jerusalem. Because somebody exceptionalized his gift. So work at it. 
Practice. Exercise and become good. Five, four things that I want to share with us about entrusting to the next generation and trusting and why it is important. Number one, you, it begins with encountering. Paul writes to Timothy in chapter 1 verse 4. says, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Verse 5, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and now in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now lives in you. What does this remind him of? The sincere faith. You see, being emotional is not equal to being spiritual. Sometimes the most emotional person in the service is not the most spiritual. It takes a sincere faith. There's a genuineness that has to be birthed in you as you allow the spirit to work in you. Yes, he works through us, it, even through our emotions. And sometimes it stirs up because we have to feel the presence of God for us to know that he's there. Because he's the one who created us with these emotions. And that's why in Psalm 103 it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Because my emotions are within me. My intellect is within me. My sense of, of understanding and gratitude is within me. I need to, there's a sense of logic that the word has to have. And there's a sense of inspiration it has to have. But there's also the sense of emotion it has to have. When you come out and you say, Ay, God was in this house. Wow, wow, wow. wow. Yeah, you could just feel God. That's <laughs> what God was moving. There is an anointing in this house. Why? Because you felt his presence. Amen? So we need to encounter God. And Paul encourages Timothy and says, you encountered God in your childhood. You encountered God in your journey. The number two is the empowering by the Holy Spirit. Chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, it says, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or fear, but as of a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind, and in some versions, self-discipline. The question I want to ask you, what drives you? Are you driven by the Spirit of God? Have you allowed the Spirit of God to fill your life? Are you walking in the Spirit so that you may not gratify the desires of the flesh? Are you allowing the Spirit to activate the gifts that are in you so that you can live a life that honors Him? Number three, Paul is not unaware of the time and season. As I said at the beginning, persecution is happening. It is not an easy time to be a Christian. And so he calls Timothy to endure hardship. Now, I've put these words in a present continuous sense. You know your kizungu, present continuous. All right? Because many times we feel like there is a season for me to endure, and then in Aisha. Hello? And so there's a place where now, hey, it's just a, I, I'm no longer struggling. <laughs> and this is one of the things that the enemy has used very effectively against believers. That we are looking for find, to find some place of rest where I'm no longer battling with the enemy. I'm no longer at war. And Paul is not telling Timothy to endure hardship just at the beginning. Even to his very end, Paul is enduring hardship as a good soldier. He's now in prison, and he says, I'm in prison for the sake of the gospel. And so, when we are talking about encountering God, it's not just a one encounter. It's not when you got saved, but are you encountering God every day of your life? Are you hearing God every day of your life? Is this relationship ongoing? Are you empowered by the Holy Spirit? Do you every day say, Spirit of God, fill me? Because today, I need new strength. Are you enduring hardship today? Are you resisting the devil every day? And so Paul tells Timothy, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Number two, he says, no one, no soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. There's a way that soldiers operate that is different. In fact, in the real sense, the army never meets civilians ordinarily. 
Do you know that? Now, I worked and lived in Rwanda for about four years. And because of some of the insecurities there, they would have the army out in the evening to secure the nation. And those soldiers would walk around and not talk to a person. This is a disciplined force. They would come out, and in the evening, they take on their weapons. They don't walk as a group. They're in battle formation. You don't walk together as a crowd. You walk in battle formation. Everyone is about a meter apart, and they walk. And depending on, this, on the level of, of insecurity, you will see how they position their guns. If they are at ease, they are down here. If there is risk a bit, they put it here. If it's, if it's very risky, they put their hand, their finger, right next to the trigger. So you could read all that. And they walk. They never talk to civilians. You will not see them coming to, stick, to stop and drink tea. They are not supposed to even enter a restaurant. When it's raining, they remove the amphibian wear and put it on. And if they were told to stand here, that's where he was positioned. If, it flow, if water is flowing, he will just stand there and let it come up until his shift is over. You can't come and tell him, oh, come for tea or come and sit here. That's not his job. If there is a problem, let's say Makanga wameanza kufight, don't you have Makanga wana fighting? They will not interfere. They will wait for the police. And they'll just look at you. The police come and solve it. They will only intervene if you overwhelm the local security. They don't intertwine with civilian affairs. We are not of this world. We are in this world. But we are not of this world. Siati watu wana, watu wana ngangana na kukatiana, pia wana ngangana na kukatiana. Omba. Omba goda kupatie lyrics. Hello? You know, some, some of these things we think are very unspiritual. No, 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 God is concerned. God is concerned about your affairs. And so, then, but you are not an ordinary person. He, there is a way that we go about this. Amen? Ata kama unaachwa, ashika kiroho. No, it's true. Unajua kula kitu gumu kama heartbreak kanisani. Nani, nani worship leader mekuacha. Na unakuja sande na endo anali represent worship. Una shindu wa sasa mungu tutalili ya tukiangali opande gani. Anifunje roho. Alafu anilete roho mtakatifu. And I'm saying this because I've been there. Hello? I'm not telling you things from history. No, 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 no. We've been there. And we've broken up. And I've had to ask myself, how would, what would Jesus do in a breakup? No, it's not, a, it's serious. Because we go online, una tukanana, sema, eh? Single, but mingling with Jesus. Ah, uh -uh, just go and heal. Allow God to heal you and restore you. Amen? We are not involved in civilian affairs. Even when you are competing, we, do, we compete by the rules of the Lord. Amen? You see, discipleship takes discipline. And discipline means there are times you want to do something that is outside of character of a disciple. But you have to restrict yourself and say, this is not how. And if you go to chapter 3, chapter 4, Paul says, but for you. But as for you. Paul is, because he's explained to him in chapter 3, he says, in the last days, this is what it will be like. But he says, but as for you. Because these last days are as such. We are on Mirema Drive. You know what goes on on this street. But don't be the one found on this street doing crazy things. But as for you, be found here preaching the gospel. Be found here in intercession. When people are walking into the clubs, you, you are walking past, in there and you are saying, God, may there be salvation in this place. God, zima yo mziki. Watch us, I know what I gospel moja. Wakwe convicted. And you know they always play gospel. 
Let there be conviction. But as for you, number four, exemplify. Distinguishing yourself. I love this scripture, chapter 2, verse 20. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter. The NIV says, if a man cleanses himself from the latter, the vessels of ordinary use. Unajuele ile kikombe ya kuchota ya maji kumwagia maua. Because it's an ordinary one. And then there's those vessels that are for noble use. If a person cleanses himself, who does the cleansing? The person. This is not God. God has already saved you, has already given you everything you need for life and godliness. Now he says you have all the gifts, you have all the abilities. All of us have been given gifts and abilities to use to make a difference in this world. But you have to ask yourself, what kind of a vessel will I be? Will I be an ordinary vessel or will I be an exceptional, exemplified vessel? Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. How do I, be, how do I exemplify myself? Chapter 2 verse 15 says, study to show yourself an approved workman who rightly handles the word of truth. Now, when we hear this many times, we think it's just about the Bible. But when Paul is telling Timothy, study to show yourself an approved workman, he's talking about whichever trade you find yourself in. As a tent maker, Paul was an excellent tent maker. If you're a businessman, study business to show yourself an approved businessman who handles rightly business. If you are a teacher, study. Watch how you in your class. When I say, Mama, say, Bio ni sumbo, like any teacher, Linga, if I can fungua, Baba. It can get. Because you are an approved workman. Today, where the world is moving, and this is a reality, people are saying, in the next season, we will not be doing school as we are doing. The, people are developing apps that have the entire education curriculum on it. CBC, you order from one. Mpaka University, they get the best teacher in biology to teach biology, and it's recorded on video. And your students now just have to download. If you are not that best teacher, answer kuomba. <laughs> Hello? Courses, I mean, uh, careers like aviation, people are now toying with the idea of having. The, the airplane fly itself. So you have to ask yourself, will I be the one sitting behind that computer managing 15 flights at the same time? Or will I be looking for a job as an Uber driver with a civil aviation license? So you have to be exceptional. When Paul is telling Timothy, study to show yourself an approved workman, he's telling him, there is a race around you. And this generation knows much more about that race than any other generation. Work hard to show yourself an approved workman. Exemplify yourself. And then the third thing he says in exemplifying yourself, he says, flee from the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness. Verse 22, Faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So there is where you set yourself aside. I want to be a vessel of noble purposes. That means I need to be able to cleanse myself. I need to live differently. I need to study. But I also need to choose the kind of company that I keep. Notice this. All the people who Paul has discipled have had the same message. We are here. We have the same call. God has called all of us. We have the same commandments and instructions. But then, there are different levels. Depending on how you choose to exemplify yourself. You see, we need to walk a journey from sincere to genuine. You see, you can be sincere and sincerely wrong. When Paul was on the road to Damascus, he was sincere. It's actually, it was actually out of his belief that Christianity was a cult. Do you know that? And so he believed he was doing God a big favor by arresting and persecuting the church. Then he met Christ 
And suddenly what was a sincere journey towards persecution turned into a genuine faith that knows who the master is. Chapter 1, verse 7. The journey of sincere, from moving from sincere to genuine. Chapter 1, verse 7. Paul says to Timothy, For God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. Do it afraid, but do it anyway. Do not be ashamed. Number two, for I am not ashamed of the gospel or the power, for it's the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jew and also for the Gentile. Do not be selfish. Number three, chapter two, verse two. Whatever you have learned, entrust to others. Do not be compromised. Verse three and four, that talks about a good soldier. Do not be lazy. Chapter two, verse 15. Study to show yourself an approved workman. Do not be common. Do not be a vessel of common use, but be an exceptional vessel. Do not Walk alone. Find people who call on the Lord with you out of a pure heart. Do you have a sincere faith? Are you empowered, filled, and driven by the Holy Spirit? Are you walking in discipleship and discipline? Are you exceptional in your work with God and in your use of the gifts and opportunities God has entrusted to you? And lastly, are you waiting to be used or are you entrusting yourself to be used at this point, even as you learn. Let us bow and pray. Father, I thank you for each and every one of us. Lord, we do not take it for granted that you've given us gifts, amazing gifts. And Lord, you're just calling us to stir up these gifts that are already existent in us. Lord, I know that some of us are afraid because we have tried once and failed. We have tried once and somebody has laughed at us. Or we have tried once and we didn't know, we don't know what next to do. Father, I pray that you would cause us to entrust to others what you've given to us. Every one of us has something significant to give into the kingdom, to give into this world, to be able to make a difference. May we not wait until the future. May we begin to utilize what we are receiving here and now. Because in teaching, we learn twice. In giving, we gain. In serving, we love twice. Lord, I pray that your spirit would speak to us. Lord, may, there may be some of us here who feel we are not yet ready, we are not yet worthy. None of us is ready. None of us is worthy. Because it's you who makes us worthy. It's you who gives us the grace to be able to do, to live, and to act according to your good purpose. And so, Lord, may your spirit stir our hearts. I just want you to take a moment and speak to God. You know where you are at. You know the gifts he has given you. You know if you've sat on those gifts or if you're utilizing them. And as the worship team comes up on stage, I want you to just pick up on those areas. And say, God, this is where my struggle is. This is where my battle is. This is what we have been given, but I have not utilized. This is the gift I have, but I have not worked on it. I have not studied to make it active. I have not gift, given myself time to grow that gift. I have been lazy with this gift. Lord, help me to work on it. Help me to sharpen it. Help me to exercise it. Help me to put it to use. I give you glory and honor for your faithfulness, for your goodness, and for your love towards us. We surrender our lives to you. We give ourselves to you. Lord, sometimes we sing songs, but we don't realize just the value, the power, the importance, the depth of the commitment that we give when we say, Lord, use us for your glory. When we say, Lord, here is my heart. Here is my life. Here are my gifts. Here are my strengths and my weaknesses alike. Use them for your glory. I surrender all to you, Lord. Everything I give 
To you I surrender, I surrender all to you, everything, Lord, everything I give to you, Lord, I and you know God has given you a certain gift. God has given you a certain ministry. God has given you a certain call. Whether it's within the church or outside and you've been sitting on it. God is saying today give it to me. Surrender it to me. And I will use you in such ways that you you cannot even imagine. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived that which God has prepared for you. If only you say, God, here I am. If you are there, just put up your hand. You're saying, I know I have a gift God has given me, but I've sat on it. I'm afraid because of one or another circumstance. And God is saying today, stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. Father, I thank you for the hands that are lifted to you. And they're saying, God, there's this gift. There is this ability. There is this talent. There is this course that you, Lord, you've set in my heart. Would you use me? Would you use me? May their journey today be marked with progress day after day after day after day. We thank you and we give you glory. We honor you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you.